Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. to the viewers. I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College, Varanasi. And today, I will be discussing on the topic United Nations. This is my sixth lecture. In the previous lectures, I have covered the emergence of international relations as an academic discipline, the theory of realism liberalism, Marxism, social constructivism and feminism. And today I will discuss on the topic United Nations. To begin with, United Nations, UN, as we all know is an international organization that was founded in the year 1945 after the devastation of World War II. The Second World War brought itself lot of dis devastation and the world was fed up of this kind of world war. So the mission of United Nation was to implement the policy so that the world could move towards peace. So with its various organs and specialized agencies, the United Nations is guided to work on the principles of the founding charter. It is mentioned in the preamble of United Nations that the role of United Nation is to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war because war is not good for anyone, not for the victors, not for the losers. So the aim of United Nation was to promote the respect for human rights, recognition of the equality of status of nations big or small, the purpose to emphasize this equality of status of nations was to avoid any kind of conflict and social progress and a better standard of life in larger freedom. The objective of United Nations was to maintain international peace and security to encourage international cooperation in the spheres of social, economic and cultural developments, then to develop friendly relations among nations on the principles of equal rights and self-determination and to recognize the fundamental rights of all people. Now we have to take into account the fact that United Nation worked on the principles of liberalism and what liberalism emphasizes the liberal institutionalism that institutions are there to convert a jungle into a zoo. That means United Nations mission was to promote international cooperation in the sphere of social, economic and cultural development, to maintain international peace and security, to develop friendly relation among nations, on what principles? Equal rights and self-determination. The nations should have the right, the people of the nation should have the uh, right to decide where they want to be and to recognize the fundamental rights of all the people. So these were the main objectives of United Nations. Now coming to the history of United Nations Foundation, 
how this idea came into being. So, in 1945 United Nation was established, but its idea of having an institution was in vogue much before that. In 1899 with the International Peace Conference that was held in the Hague, there was the you know uh, objective to elaborate instrument for settling crisis peacefully. Now, you have to emphasize on the fact that there is there was a need of instrument for settling crisis in which way peacefully for preventing wars and codifying rules of warfare. It adopted the convention for pacific settlement of international disputes and established the permanent court of arbitration which started working in 1902 and this permanent court of arbitration is the forerunner of United Nation International Court of Justice. Now, what is the forerunner of United Nation? As we all know that it is League of Nations. The idea of League of Nations came into being after the end of the First World War and it was established as an organization with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. So, this idea was also an offshoot of liberalism. Then international labor organization was also created in 1919 through this Treaty of Versailles as an affiliated agency of the League of Nations. Now, coming back to United Nations. The name United Nation was coined by United States of America's President Franklin D. Roosevelt. There was a document called the Declaration by United Nation and this document was signed in 1942 by 26 nations with the objective to establish United Nations and the countries pledged that they will fight together against the Axis powers that is Germany, Italy and Japan and they will fight together with this Axis and bound them against making a separate peace. So, this point also emphasizes on cooperation the concept of collective security. Then United Nations Conference on International Organization that was in 1945. This conference was held in San Francisco and it was attended by 50 countries and after that United Nations Charter got signed and the United Nations Charter is considered as the foundation treaty of United Nations. Now, coming to the organs of the United Nations, we will look into these organs one by one in detail from the next slide. So, it is a General Assembly, Security Council, Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the International Court of Justice and the Secretariat. These are the six organs of United Nation that was formed when that was established when United Nation was formed. Now, focusing on General Assembly. So, General Assembly is known as the main deliberative body of United Nations and its main task is the policy making. It is known as the representative organ of United Nation because all the countries those who are the member of United Nation they all have the membership of General Assembly. So, all the member states of United Nation are represented in General Assembly and that is why this body is known as the known for its universal representation 
and each year all the members meet in the general assembly for annual general assembly session and debate and discussion among them take place. They have discussion on important co issues such as those on peace, security, admission of any new member or budget related matters. And if, uh, if discussion take place on any topic and if a resolution needs to be passed, they require two third majority of the general assembly. And decision on any questions are by simple majority. The president of the general assembly is elected every year by the assembly and the term of the president is one year. Now what are the main committees that work on the principles of general assembly and in turn the United Nation. So the first committee is disarmament and international security. Second committee is for economic and financial matters. Third committee is social, humanitarian and for cultural purposes. Fourth committee is for special political and for decolonization. Fifth is for administrative and budgetary functions and sixth is for legal functions. There are other committees also. One is the general committee. It meets periodically throughout each session to review the progress of general assembly and its committees. It also makes recommendation for furthering such progresses. Now, in general committee, there is president of the general assembly and 21 vice presidents of the assembly and chairman of the six main committees that we have discussed in the previous slide. And the five permanent members of the security council serve as vice president as well. Then the credential committee. Credential committee is mandated to examine the credentials of representatives of member state and to report to the general assembly. Now what are the functions of United Nations General Assembly? First is to approve the United Nations budget and to establish the financial assessments of member states. Also they have the function to elect the non-permanent members of the United Nations Security Council and also the members of other United Nations organs and councils on the recommendation of the United Nations Security Council. They appoint the general, sorry, secretary general. They also make recommendations on the principles of cooperation for maintaining international peace and security. And they can discuss on any issues related to international peace and security. In fact, they can discuss on any matter which is within the scope of United Nations Charter because they are the deliberative body. And after discussion, they can also make recommendation for the peaceful settlement of any dispute, any situation. And they also consider reports from the various United Nations organs, the other organs of the United Nations. And after that they make recommendations also so that global political cooperation, development of international law, realization of human rights, fundamental freedom, international collaboration on social, economic, cultural and humanitarian health and other educational fields, they can make recommendation on any of these fields. Now coming to the security council, United Nations security council is the most powerful organ of the United Nation and it has the prime responsibility as per the UN Charter for maintenance of international peace and security. So the security council is made up of 15 members, there are 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent members. The 5 permanent members are China, France, Russia, UK and US. 
and the 10 non permanent members they are elected for the period of 2 years by the general assembly and that takes place on regional basis. Now, the decisions taken by the UNHC that is United Nations Security Council is by vote. So, if 9 of the 15 among those 5 are permanent and 10 are non-permanent. If the 9 out of 15 members say yes, however, if any it can get passed, but if any permanent member say no or use their veto power, then the resolution is not passed. So, the ultimate power lies with the permanent members. Now, what is veto power? Veto power is the most important power in the United Nation and that makes the five permanent members of the United Nation powerful, United Nations Security Council members. So, veto power refers to the power of the permanent members to veto that means to reject on any resolution of security council. So, the unconditional veto passed by the five government, five permanent members can be seen as the most undemocratic characteristics of United Nation. Although United Nation is inclined for securing democracy, but this is the most undemocratic thing that takes place in United Nation. And the critics of veto power say that it is the main cause for the international inaction on war crimes and crimes against humanity. But the thing is that during the formation of United Nation, USA refused to be the part of United Nations and is said that until and unless it get the power of veto, it would not accept the membership of United Nation. And the uh, people who support veto power, they regard it as a promoter of international stability and it, the veto power can put a check against military interventions and it can be a safeguard against any kind of domination. Next organ is the Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC. So, Economic and Social Council is the principal body for coordination, policy review, policy dialogue and recommendations on economic, social and environmental issues as well as implementation of internationally agreed development goals. It has 54 members elected by the general assembly for 3 years term. So, it is the United Nation platform for debate, reflection and innovative thinking on sustainable development. So, each year ECOSOC structure its work around a uh, annual theme that can be of global importance to sustainable development that ensures focused attention among ECOSOC partners. ECOSOC also coordinates the work of 14 United Nations specialized agencies, 10 functional commissions and 5 regional commissions and it receives reports from 9 UN fund and programs and issues policy recommendations to the UN system. The bodies that are within the purview of ECOSOC are a specialized agencies that is International Labour Organization, Food and Agriculture Organization, United Nation Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization that is UNESCO, World Health Organization, World Bl Bank Group, International Monetary Fund IMF, International Civil Aviation Organization. International Maritime Organization, International Telecommunication Union, Universal Postal Union, World Meteorological Organization, World Intellectual Property Organization, United Nation Fund for Agricultural Development, United Nation Industrial Development Organization 
and World Tourism Organization. These are the specialized agencies of UN. Then coming to the functional commissions, there is Statistical Commission, Commission on Population and Development, Commission on Social Development, Commission on Human Rights, Commission on the Status of Women, Commission on Narcotic Drugs, Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice, Commission on Science and Technology for Development, Commission on Sustainable Development and United Nations Forum on Forest. There are regional commissions that is Economic Commission for Africa, Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, Economic Commission for Europe, Economic Commission for Latin America and Caribbean and Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. There are standing committees that is Committee for Program and Coordination, Commission on Human Settlement, Committee on Non-Governmental Organizations, Committee on Negotiations with Intergovernmental Agencies, Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, these are the standing committees. There are some bodies that are related that, that is International Narcotics Control Board, Board of Trustees of the International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women, Committee for United Nations Population Award, Program Coordination Board of the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, Funds and Programs which send report to ECOSOC, United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. United Nations Development Fund for Women, United Nations Development Program UNDP, United Nations Economic Program UNEP, Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, United Nations Population Fund, United Nations Relief and Work Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, Office for Drug Control and Crime Prevention, World Food Program, UN Habitat, now coming to the trusteeship council. The trusteeship council was established as I said that all the six organs of the United Nations got established in 1945. So trusteeship council was established to oversee the administration of trust territories and to ensure their transition to self-government or independence because at that time the process of decolonization was going on. But it functions was completed in 1994 because the last trust territory was Palau. So the trust council has suspended its operation and but under the UN charter it continues to exist on paper. Technically it has no work to do now. So its future and its work remains uncertain. Coming to the International Court of Justice. International Court of Justice is the primary judicial organ of United Nations and it is a successor of permanent court of international justice that I discussed previously. So International Court of Justice consists of panel of 15 judges elected by the United Nations General Assembly and Security Council for 9 years. United Nations Secretariat, the next organ. So what is the role of the secretariat? It is the executive body, executive arm of the United Nation. Thus the secretariat has the role for deliberative and decision making body of the United Nation. So its main purpose is to carry out day to day work of the United Nation and it is headed by the secretary general. And that secretary general is appointed by general assembly on the recommendation of security council. So the secretary general is the chief administrative officer of the organization and it, it has a term of 5 years and that term is renewable. Now coming to the United Nations funds and programs. The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF. So originally it is known as the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund. And it was created by the United Nations General Assembly in 1946 with the purpose to provide emergency food and health care to children and mother in countries that has been devastated because of the war. 
as I discussed in the previous lecture that in the con topic of feminism that how women suffer in conflict. So, it is not only the women, the children are also the worst sufferers of conflict. So, UNICEF was formed for to provide emergency food and health care to children and mothers in the countries that was devastated because of the war. In 1950, UNICEF mandate was extended and it now included the long term needs of children and women in developing countries everywhere, not only the countries that were devastated because of the war. And in 1953, it became the permanent part of UN system. Then the United Nations Population Fund. United Nations Population Fund is formally known as the United Nations Fund for Population Activities. So, it is the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency and ECOSOC establishes its mandate. So, United Nations Population, uh, United Nations Population Fund was directly to tackle sustainable development goals on health, education, gender equality. And what does its aim for? Its mission is to deliver a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe and every young person's potential is fulfilled. Then coming to the United Nations Development Program. United Nations Development Program that is UNDP is United Nations Global Development Network and it was established in 1965 by the General Assembly and UNDP provides export advice, training and grants to support developing countries with the emphasis on assistance to least developed countries. Coming to the United Nations Environment Program UNEP. So, UNEP is a is related to the environmental problem, it is global environmental authority and it sets the global environmental agenda. It promotes the implementation of the in, uh, environmental dimension of sustainable development within the United Nations system. It was founded by General Assembly as a result of the United Nations Conference on Human Environment that is also known as the Stockholm in Conference and that took place in 1972. And since its foundation, the United Nations Environment Program has played a very important role in the development of multilateral environmental agreements because it actually made the people, made the institutions realize the importance of conserving environment. Then the United Nations Environment Assembly. So, what is environment, United Nations Environment Assembly? It is the governing body of United Nations Environment Program and it is the world's highest level of decision making body on the topic of environment and it sets priority for global environmental policies. It was created in June 2012 during the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development which is also known as Rio 20. The United Nations Human Settlement Program, UN Habitat. The UN Habitat was established in 1978 and it is the program of the United Nations that is committed to work towards a better urban future with the mission to promote socially and environmentally sustainable human settlement development and achievement of adequate shelter for all. Nobody should be without home. Then the World Food Program. World Food Program is a leading humanitarian organization and it is saving lives and also changing lives because food is a basic necessity of human being. Not only human being, 
the living creatures. So, delivering food assistance in emergencies and working with communities to improve nutrition and build resilience. The food should be nutritious. So, World Food Program was established in 1963 by the Food and Agriculture Organization and United Nations General Assembly. Then UN specialized agencies. So, UN specialized agencies are autonomous organizations, but they are working within the United Nations. So, these specialized agencies came in terms to the United Nations through negotiations, negotiated agreements. Some of them were existing uh, before even the first world war some of them were associated with League of Nations. Others were created along with the United Nations. Others were created when the need was filled for. So, article 57 to 63 of the UN Charter provides the provision for creating specialized agencies. Then the Food and Agriculture Organization FAO. In 1945, FAO was created and Food and Agriculture Organization is a specialized agency of UN. For what purpose? To defeat hunger and Food and Agriculture Organization is also a source of knowledge and information and help the developing countries in transition modernize and improve agriculture, forestry, fishing practices, ensuring good nutrition and food security for all. Then the International Civil Aviation Organization. So, under the Chicago Convention, the International Civil Aviation Organization was established in 1944 and it manages the administration and governance of the convention on international civil aviation. So, the international civil aviation organization basically provides the principles and techniques of the international air navigation to ensure safe and orderly growth. Then the international fund for agricultural development. It was established as an international financial institution in 1977 through the United Nations General Assembly resolution and it is one of the major outcome of the World Food Conference that took place in 1974. So, basically this conference was organized by the United Nations in response to the food crisis of the early uh, 1970s because these food crises were causing widespread fam famine and malnutrition. And it was realized that the food insecurity and famine was not the failure of the food production, rather there is, is the problem in the structure, there is a structural problem. So, this organization was, this uh, particular agency was formed to look after that problem that what is the problem in the structure, how people are not getting that basic thing. Then the international labor organization. So, international labor organization is the United Nation agency whose mandate is it to advance social justice and to promote decent work environment. So, it sets international labor standard, promotes right at work and encourages decent environment opportunities. So, as to avoid the exploitation of the workers, of the labors. So, it focused on the enhancement of social protection and strengthening of dialogue on work related issues. So, basically it was created in 1990 as a part of the League of Nations and then 
International Labour Organization became the UN specialized agency in the year 1946 after the formation of the United Nations. Then coming to the IMF, International Monetary Fund. So, after the end of the World War II, Bretton Woods Conference was held because war not only causes devastation in the battlefield, it causes devastation in terms of politics, in terms of economy, in terms of society, everywhere. The impact of war can be felt everywhere. So, after the end of the Second World War, Britain Woods Conference was held to regulate the international monetary and financial order. And as a result of that, IMF was formed in 1945 and IMF worked for furthering international monetary cooperation and for the expansion of trade and economic growth. Basically, IMF discourages those policies that can harm prosperity. And to fulfill these missions, IMF member countries work in collaboration with each other and with other international bodies. Then the World Bank, it was created in 1944 as the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So, International Bank for Reconstruction and Development later became World Bank. So, World Bank Group is a unique global partnership of five institutions working for sustainable solution that, that is aimed to reduce poverty and build shared prosperity in developing countries. Basically, they aim to provide support to developing countries they lend money to developing countries for long term at a very minimal interest. Then International Maritime Organization. The International Maritime Organization is the United Nation specialized agency and its responsibility is the safety and security of shipping. So that marine and atmospheric pollution by ships can be prevented. Then the International Telecommunication Union. The International Telecommunication Union is responsible for issues that concern information and communication technologies. And the International Telecommunication is the oldest of all the specialized agencies of United Nations. Then coming to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization that is UNESCO. So, UNESCO was formed in 1945 to develop the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind. So, in its spirit UNESCO basically focuses on developing educational tools to help people live as global citizens they should not be restricted to any particular region or any particular area. And thus, they should be free from any kind of hate and intolerance. So, by promoting the cultural heritage and equal dignity of all the cultures, all cultures must get equal respect. So, basically UNESCO works for strengthening bond among nations. It basically wants to unite all the cultures so that people may feel that they are on equal terms. Then the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is the specialized agency for health as the name is evident and it was established in 1948. And the World Health Organization is intergovernmental organization as it works in collaboration with its member states. So, World Health Organization is basically responsible for the global health matters, for shaping the health research agenda, for setting norms and standards, providing evidence based policy options, providing technical support to countries and monitoring and assessing health trends. 
then the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development UNCTAD. United Nations Conference on Trade and Development supports developing countries so that they can assess the benefit of globalized economy on more fair terms and in effective way. So, they help us to use trade, investment, finance and technology as a vehicle, as a tool for inclusive and sustainable development. The growth must be inclusive. The development needs to be sustainable in nature. Then the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. So, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime is a global leader in fight against illicit drugs and international crime. It is a global leader and it was established in 1997 through the merger of merger between the United Nations Drug Control Program and Center for International Crime Prevention. So, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime is basically there to assist member states in their struggle against these illicit drugs, crime and prevention. Next is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR. So, UNHCR was created in 1950 after the Second World War because the effect was of Second World War was that people started migrating in large numbers and there was no provision for them. So, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was basically created to help the people who were fleeing from their homes, from their countries. And with the 21st century, it is seen that United Nations High Commissioner for, hum, uh, for Refugees has been of, of significant help for the refugees in Africa, Middle East and Asia and it also uses its expertise in case of in internally displaced persons also. Although it is not directly connected to IDPs that is internally displaced people, but it has played its role in helping all those who are in a situation of being stateless. Then the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific as the name signifies that it basically works in Asia and Pacific. So, it responds to the development needs and priorities of the region through convening authority, economic and social analysis, normative standard setting and technical assistance and it was formed in 1947. Now, coming to the UN's contribution to world, what has been the contribution of the United Nation to the world? First, United Nation has played its significant role in maintaining the peace and security all over the world. What the charter of the United Nation basically signifies that the main role of the United Nation is to maintain peace and security. So, United Nations has worked towards maintaining peace and security. United Nations has also played its role in preventing the nuclear proliferation through its International Atomic Energy Agency IAEA. It has also supported disarmament. It has also worked for preventing genocide. United Nations has made a significant remark in the process of development for elevating ruler poverty, for focusing on African development which belongs to the underdevelopment, it belongs to underdeveloped region. It has also worked for promoting women's well-being for fighting hunger that I have already discussed in the previous slides and it is committed 
to support children because children are the future of the world it has worked for preserving historic cultural architectural and natural sites and it has taken a lead on global issues for fostering democracy although united nations security council in united nations security council the provision of veto is the most undemocratic thing but then also united nation has worked to bring democracy to foster democracy around the world it has helped to resolve many international disputes it has worked for combating international crimes through its various agencies it has worked on humanitarian affairs united nation is there to help whenever there is a need for humanitarian uh, need on the basis of humanitarian crisis and it has also worked for promoting health and the well being but united nation is not free from challenges there are lot of challenges the first and foremost is the united nation administrative and financial resources challenges there are administrative and financial challenges that united nation is facing then there are peace and security issues united nation has not been able to solve the problems of all the all the countries of the world it has been selective in its nature because the bodies that are basically supporting united nation the work of the united nation has been based on their inclination what those supporting bodies those supporting countries wanted united nation has worked as per them because it is suffering from financial and resources challenges and from as united nation was established in 1945 and now it's 2024 so of course there is need to reform the security council because the permanent membership of united nation security council was given to those countries who were the victors of the second world war but now we are in the 21st century so there there is need for change and many deserving countries are there that should be given the permanent membership of united nation security council reformation is needed but till now there has been no reformation the main problem is the veto power the extraordinary power that is given to the permanent members of the united nation security council these members can use veto power as per their own whims they are not concerned if we view this whole concept from the realist point of view countries are basically self interested so veto power has been used to further the self interest countries has promoted their national interest they have put the, uh, their national interest above the welfare of all and as the time is passing the new non conventional challenges are coming up and posing challenge to united nation the most re most recent has been the covid 19 pandemic the solution for covid 19 was with nowhere nobody provided the immediate solution 
and it was the biggest humanitarian crisis that the world saw. So, there are of course, the challenges that United Nation is facing. But despite those challenges, United Nation has played a very constructive role as the six organs of the United Nation, various committees, various agencies, all those bodies are working to bring solution to the problems. And United Nation has contributed in making human society more civil, more peaceful, more secure in comparison to the times when it was not existing. So, United Nation has been playing its responsibility and it is inclined to make the world more democratic. It has contributed in the economic development. It has worked to remove poverty and for preserving the earth ecosystem. So, we can say that although we cannot deny the fact that United Nation is facing challenges, because the countries those who are providing funds to the United Nation, United Nation will work as per their orders, whatever they will say to United Nation. But the contribution of the United Nation cannot be undermined, because as the liberal institutionalists say that at least it has turned a jungle into a zoo. So, United Nation has worked to turn a jungle into a zoo. Although there are many shortcomings, there are many loopholes that are there and United Nation is failing on certain grounds. But it does not mean that United Nation is not required. We need institutions such as United Nation and many other institutions are also needed so that we can make this world more cooperative, more peaceful, more democratic and we can have a more inclination towards collective being, so that we can work collectively and work towards international peace and security. Thank you. Hello, I am A.K. Sharma and I teach sociology in IIT Kanpur. Uh, I am trying to answer a simple question, how sociologists explain their facts. As you know that uh, sociology was developed as a subject dealing with human behavior, but which would use the tools and techniques of science, mathematics, physics, chemist, chemistry. But this view that uh, human behavior needs to be studied scientifically has been contradicted later on. And it was said that simply by relating one kind of facts with other kinds of facts, you cannot understand human behavior to to understand human behavior or to actually theorize about human behavior, 
you have to theorize the theories or motivations or meanings that people have in their mind uh, in involving in a particular action. Now, uh, using these two traditions, one tradition in which we relate one fact of society with other facts scientifically and another tradition in which we try to develop second order constructs or theories of theories that people have in their mind in acting in day to day life. Now, they have produced two different traditions in sociology. One is called quantitative, another is called qualitative. Quantitative methodology uses scientific methods of conducting surveys, censuses, experiments uh, and uh, then by using statistical methods from simple method like uh, arithmetic mean uh, to sophisticated methods like logistic regression, we try to arrive at uh, some inference. Qualitative tradition, qualitative methodology on the other hand uses ethnographic approach and here the researcher uh, attempts to become part of the community which he or she intends to study. Because the assumption is that only by becoming part of the community, by living among the people whom you are studying and by putting yourself in their shoes, by trying to understand things or their environment or their behavior or their culture or festivals or economic behavior or politics from their angle, from their perspective, how they feel, what, what understanding they carry in their mind, that only by understanding these things we can understand facts of society. Actually, in one of the latest works, uh, World Bank, you know, which uses a lot of statistics, has also talked about uh, understanding mental models that people use in involving in behavior. Emile Durkheim long back said that sociology uses comparative method and let me just give one example and uh, then I will finish. Suppose I tell you that infant mortality rate in India is 40, what does it mean? It means nothing. But when you compare infant mortality of India today with Japan and you find that Japan has 2 and India has 40 then you get disturbed, then you start thinking why is it that infant mortality in India is so high. And then you can also compare infant mortality of India with infant mortality of say Kenya or Mozambique or other countries and you find that uh, these countries have much higher infant mortality than India. And then you can uh, create a hypothesis that perhaps uh, econo economic development has something to do with infant mortality. Countries which are more developed, countries like Japan, they have low infant mortality. Countries like Mozambique or Kenya, which are less developed, have higher infant mortality. So, you have a connection. This is what sociology is about, connection between facts. So, by using census, surveys, by conducting field work, by using ethnographic methods, by using comparative methods, we arrive at sociological findings. Use of experimental method in sociology has been very less, uh, but I learned that recently economists, which I 10 years ago I could not uh, uh, see that economists will one day use experimental method, but today we find that economists are using lot of experimental methods to study human behavior. Now, this work may be done by economists, but the findings of their study can very well be called sociological studies. So, sociology tomorrow, uh, 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 I think that sociology tomorrow in addition to uh, using surveys and comparative methods will also be using experimental methods. Thank you.